Recording by Ruth Golding. The Human Machine by Arnold Bennett. Chapter One. Taking Oneself for Granted. There are men who are capable of loving a machine more deeply than they can love a woman. They are among the happiest men on earth. This is not a sneer meanly shot from cover at women. It is simply a statement of notorious fact. Men who worry themselves to distraction over the perfecting of a machine are indubitably blessed beyond their kind. Most of us have known such men. Yesterday they were constructing motor cars, but today aeroplanes are in the air, or at any rate they ought to be, according to the inventors. Watch the inventors. Invention is not usually their principal business. They must invent in their spare time. They must invent before breakfast. Invent in the strand between lionses and the office. Invent after dinner. Invent on Sundays. See with what ardor they rush home of a night. See how they seize a half holiday like hungry dogs a bone. They don't want golf. Bridge, limericks, novels, illustrated magazines, clubs, whisky, starting prices, hints about neckties, political meetings, yarns, comic songs, and turic salts, nor the smiles that are situate between a gay corsage and a picture hat. They never wonder at a loss what they will do next. Their evenings never drag, are always too short. You may indeed catch them at twelve o'clock at night on the flat of their backs, but not in bed. No, in a shed under a machine, holding a candle whose paths drop fatness up to the connecting rod that is strained or the wheel that is out of center. They are continually interested, nay, enthralled. They have a machine, and they are perfecting it. They get one part right, and then another goes wrong, and they get that right, and then another goes wrong, and so on. When they are quite sure they have reached perfection, forth issues the machine out of the shed, and in five minutes is smashed up, together with a limb or so of the inventors, just because they had been quite sure too soon. Then the whole business starts again. They do not give up. That particular wreck was, of course, due to a mere oversight. The whole business starts again. For they have glimpsed perfection. They have the gleam of perfection in their souls. Thus their lives run away. They will never fly, you remark cynically. Well, if they don't. Besides, what about right? With all your cynicism, have you never envied them their machine and their passionate interest in it? You know, perhaps, the moment when, brushing in front of the glass, you detected your first grey hair. You stopped brushing. Then you resumed brushing hastily. You pretended not to be shocked. But you were. Perhaps you know a more disturbing moment than that. The moment when it suddenly occurred to you that you had arrived as far as you ever will arrive, and you had realized as much of your early dream as you ever will realize, and the realization was utterly unlike the dream. The marriage was excessively prosaic and eternal, not at all what you expected it to be, and your illusions were dissipated, and games and hobbies had an unpleasant core of tedium and futility, and the ideal tobacco mixture did not exist, and one literary masterpiece resembled another, and all the days that are to come will more or less resemble the present day until you die, and in an illuminating flash you understood what all those people were driving at when they wrote such unconscionably long letters to the telegraph as to life being worth living or not worth living. 
and there was naught to be done but face the grey, monotonous future and pretend to be cheerful, with the worm of ennui gnawing at your heart. In a word, the moment when it occurred to you that yours is the common lot. In that moment, have you not wished, do not continually wish, for an exhaustless machine? A machine that you could never get to the end of? Would you not give your head to be lying on the flat of your back, peering with a candle, dirty, foiled, catching cold, but absorbed in the pursuit of an object? Have you not gloomily regretted that you were born without a mechanical turn, because there is really something about a machine? It has never struck you that you do possess a machine. Oh, blind, oh, dull, it has never struck you that you have at hand a machine wonderful beyond all mechanisms in sheds, intricate, delicately adjustable, of astounding and miraculous possibilities, interminably interesting. That machine is yourself. This fellow is preaching. I won't have it, you exclaim resentfully. Dear sir, I am not preaching. And even if I were, I think you would have it. I think I can anyhow keep hold of your button for a while, though you pull hard. I am not preaching. I am simply bent on calling your attention to a fact which has perhaps wholly or partially escaped you. Namely, that you are the most fascinating bit of machinery that ever was. You do yourself less than justice. It is said that men are only interested in themselves. The truth is that as a rule men are interested in every mortal thing except themselves. They have a habit of taking themselves for granted. And that habit is responsible for nine-tenths of the boredom and despair on the face of the planet. A man will wake up in the middle of the night, usually owing to some form of delightful excess, and his brain will be very active indeed for a space ere he can go to sleep again. In that candid hour, after the exaltation of the evening and before the hope of the dawn, he will see everything in its true colours, except himself. There is nothing like a sleepless couch for a clear vision of one's environment. He will see all his wife's faults and the hopelessness of trying to cure them. He will momentarily see, though with less sharpness of outline, his own faults. He will probably decide that the anxieties of children outweigh the joys connected with children. He will admit all the shortcomings of existence, will face them like a man, grimly, sourly, in a sturdy despair. He will mutter, Of course I'm angry! Who wouldn't be? Of course I'm disappointed! Did I expect this twenty years ago? Yes, we ought to save more, but we don't, so there you are. I'm bound to worry. I know I should be better if I didn't smoke so much. I know there's absolutely no sense at all in taking liqueurs. Absurd to be ruffled with her when she's in one of her moods. I don't have enough exercise. Can't be regular somehow. Not the slightest use hoping that things will be different, because I know they won't. Queer world. Never really what you may call happy, you know. Now, if things were different, he loses consciousness. Observe. He has taken himself for granted, just glancing at his faults and looking away again. It is his environment that has occupied his attention, and his environment, things, that he would wish to have different. Did he not know, out of the fullness of experience, that it is futile to desire such a change? What he wants is a pipe that won't put itself into his mouth, a glass that won't leap of its own accord to his lips, 
money that won't slip untouched out of his pocket, legs that without asking will carry him certain miles every day in the open air, habits that practice themselves, a wife that will expand and contract according to his humours, like a Wernicke bookcase, always complete but never finished. Wise man, he perceives at once that he can't have these things, and so he resigns himself to the universe and settles down to a permanent, restrained discontent. No one shall say he is unreasonable. You see, he has given no attention to the machine. Let us not call it a flying machine. Let us call it simply an automobile. There it is on the road, jolting, screeching, rattling, perfuming. And there he is, saying, This road ought to be as smooth as velvet. That hill in front is ridiculous, and the descent on the other side positively dangerous. And it's all turns. I can't see a hundred yards in front. He has a wild idea of trying to force the county council to sandpaper the road or of employing the new territorial army to remove the hill. But he dismisses that idea. He is so reasonable. He accepts all. He sits clothed in reasonableness on the machine and accepts all. Ass! you exclaim. Why doesn't he get down and inflate that tyre for one thing? Anyone can see the sparking apparatus is wrong, and it's perfectly certain the gearbox wants oil. Why doesn't he... I will tell you why he doesn't. Just because he isn't aware that he is on a machine at all. He has never examined what he is on. And at the back of his consciousness is a dim idea that he is perched on a piece of solid, immutable rock that runs on casters. End of chapter one.